So our theme for this week is what is the embodied heart? But I'd like to explore that a little bit here um, in two parts. First, by asking the question, what is embodiment? And then what is uh, the heart or what is heartfulness? Um, <clears throat> now, the reason why I like inquiry is because it doesn't require me, at least in my role, to give an answer. Uh, we can just practice and sit with that question and see what arises, which is much more immediate and direct in our experience of what we might discover that might be useful in deepening our own experience around whatever those words point to. That being said, practically speaking, it can be nice to explore it a little bit before doing practice to kind of open up windows into our experience of what we might explore uh, in, in uh, a more formal practice. So what is embodiment? Um, I've sat with this question quite a lot, even though I, I obviously, those of you who know me, know that this is a big component for me personally, and I'm also in um, how I teach. And, you know, with uh, Judith Blackstone and her realization process approach has a big emphasis on embodiment. And yet I still have sat with that question so much partly experientially, but partly linguistically from that angle, because words can incorporate so much. And one of the easiest ways I can give an example of something similar is if somebody asked me, what is meditation? I guess it's just, I, I mean, I, kind of have to only, I can only chuckle at the question because I'm just like, what, what isn't meditation? Or, you know, I don't mean that from like some like wise perspective, like, you know, ha ha. I'm trying to be a Zen master or something. I mean, just like, no, seriously. It's like, I don't know how to, if I, if I answer that question, meditation is this, certainly it's going to exclude something that is meditation or that might be considered meditation. So it's not even worth me defining. What's more useful is saying, for example, the six ways of meditating that we use at Buddhist Geeks. That's interesting to say like, well, here are six possible categories that aren't, aren't they don't represent an exhaustive list, but they provide a little resolution in how we might make discernment in our experience and different ways we might practice. It's a nice starting point. So embodiment is something similar for me. It's such a big word that I just, I don't want to define it. And I have resistance to, uh, to when I hear uh, people defining and say embodiment is this. Because as soon as it's that, then all of a sudden, I feel like it creates fragmentation in my experience and, and other people's experience. Because if I don't meet that version of embodiment, then, oh, I'm not embodied or whatever that means, you know, see, it goes, it just starts unraveling from there. Instead, um, I have found it useful to try to utilize it as broadly as possible. And again, as a starting point, and I, I realized partly the one way I might define it is that is not leaving the body out. Uh, that might be the simplest way for me. I'm not going to, in, at least for sure, not intentionally exclude the body for me um, as, as being part of my practice or that it's potentially part of my practice. Again, it doesn't mean that uh, the body or the somatic experience has to be a focal point, but I'm definitely not going, I'm going to look out for any efforts to say, no, let's forget the body. That's, that would be for me the most damaging in a certain way. But also there's a sense for me too, that it's, it is difficult anymore for me to not include the body in my practice in some way. Uh, in um, uh, one of my mentors I worked with in the past, Hokai Sobel, it's a quote I, I, I use often, but he said something like this, that wherever there's an experience, there's a body, okay? And so why not in, in include the body in our practice? And I meditated a, a many, many years where I didn't, that wasn't even the goal. Like if it was, uh, my goal was to experience radical open awareness. It was like, as long as the body's not getting in my way, great, you know, but then the integration of it in, in, in my life was really difficult. There was a, a, a schism, a split my experience where maybe I could sit on the cushion and attune to this awareness, but not fully through my experience and, and not in life. And, and along with the definition of like, I don't want to exclude the body from practice. I also feel that 
working with our body is is a much our birthright as working with the mind. So in meditation, we have no problem saying saying something like that, like, yeah, if we're alive, we have a mind and why not work with mind? Same thing for the body. It's it's just possible to work with. Now, the many, there's so many varieties of ways of working with what might be referred to embodiment. And just like, where's my little list of different things here? You know, spontaneous kinesthetic expression, you know, that maybe it's not a form of dance or anything like that. I'm just gonna see how the body moves. Or maybe it is dance, like artistic expression. Maybe it's martial arts, maybe it's calisthenics. So for me, uh, man, the pandemic has just wrecked my previous uh, <laughs> physical level goals of, of health. But I really got into calisthenics, you know, like pull-ups and different kind of things like that that are kind of gymnastic. But I consider that embodiment too for me. So, so many forms of working with the body, Tai Chi, Qi Gong, you know, the list goes on and on. But if if we're here, we have some sense of a, a corporeal experience. And even going further, someone like Ken Wilbur uh, have noted that in traditions, there's a there's distinctions between the gross body, the subtle body and the causal body. So, and different, different experiences can correlate to these different bodies and we can work with each of those bodies in, in our experience. So I guess, you know, part of what I wanted to say is that to leave this open, and that's why I like the question. So even if sitting with the question, what is embodiment? Sit with that long enough and see what arises. I also am endlessly fascinated with linguistics because language is not pinned down into like a box where it's like defined, like you look under a rock and says, this word absolutely means this. At the same time, we need, we need words to help us communicate, to talk, to share meaning, to share practices. And embodiment is a useful term in that sense for me. Now, as far as a little bit further of how I use it, and especially how we use it at Buddhist Geeks, if you look into our guide, um, we use a phrase that really um, Judith Blackstone highlighted, and that is inhabiting the body. So again, if I go one step further of, of how I use it beyond saying, I'm going to include the body, I'm going, to, I'm going to not exclude it. It's inhabiting the body. And the quote here, and I've shared this kind of quote from Judith in many a times, and she's uh, she shares this quite a lot. Inhabiting the body is not the same as being aware of the body. It is not a top-down experience. Inhabiting the body means that we live within our body, that we are present throughout the whole internal space of our body. It means that we feel that we are made of consciousness everywhere in our body. Another, there, there are many ways to extend here what is meant by this, but also thinking, feeling, and sensing all at once. Uh, the, the sense that we take up space, that we have a place in this world that we live in, this that's defined physically by the body, but includes more than the body. Like here I am, here we are. And I'm connected to what's happening out, outwardly, that there is a distinction and yet not a separation uh, that's a lived experience. So inner and outer become more seamless too. Now, some of these things are can be worded in a way that's really ideal, that says, oh, like here's an ideal uh, of what we can achieve. But that's also something I tend to avoid. And, 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 and I encourage myself and you all to approach embodiment curiously with compassion, patience, and loving kindness towards yourself. Because even though we can attune to a, a part of ourselves that feels ever present and unchanging, which is really powerful to, to relax into, we're, everything's changing every day. Some days we're more tired than others. Some days we're dealing with the pandemic <laughs> for uh, more, more than days, months, year. And that has an impact on it that on us that's very real and that's going to reflect in a practice where we are incorporating our full being including our body so to me it becomes counterproductive to like set my sights on some perfect endpoint that i will then become embodied rather it's really useful to practice embodiment to pr be practicing embodiment um so what else do I want to say about embodiment? Really, yeah, a befriending of an experience here. That's another feeling to me that, again, this isn't a prescription. There's not a prescription of what you should do to, quote, be embodied. But there are a lot of good practices that can be really useful to explore that for yourself. And really what my experience is that even though we'll, it's useful and common to go through standard practices and point to 
common experiences we share, our relationship to that of like of our own path awakening is can be very, very unique individually and collectively of, of, of um, the relationships we have in life. Okay, so um, very much approaching with curiosity and befriending our experience, I find very useful for embodiment. Now, moving over to the heart, again, another big question. I sat down and I was thinking, if I say heart, I think probably all of you will say, oh yeah, yeah, okay. I, you're, in, you're in the same, we're in the same ballpark here. You're not gonna be like, what do you mean by heart? I have no idea. Probably not, if, you, if that's coming up, totally okay. But I, that's my feeling at first of like, well, if I'm going to define this, I really was, had a moment of being like, mm, I don't know, what, what would I say about it um, that I would feel confident with and saying, yeah, this is heart. So it's something similar there. It's like, well, when we say that word, where does it point to in our experience that starts illuminating part of our, part of our lived existence and what it means to be human and what kind of practices emerge out of that, that would be useful. So we use the word heartfulness at Buddhist Geeks, which I quite like. It's a, I think it's now a word, but it was a made up word in a sense. It, was, it didn't exist at some point, you know, not too long ago, but it, it obviously mirrors mindfulness. So I decided I was like, I'm going to look at mindfulness and see the, the uh, etymology of, of that word and really how it came from, I, I knew it was going to come from Sanskrit or Pali or something else. Okay. Even though it has its own journey in the, you know, English and other languages, I think like French maybe. But mindfulness here comes uh, uh, from two terms, sati and pali, and I'm not sure about the Sanskrit word, smriti. Gosh, I almost started speaking Spanish. Uh, perhaps uh, smriti. Um, now, that means recollect, remember, bear in mind, um, and uh, that which is remembered. And there was really an emphasis by some um, really geeky Buddhist practitioners like uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, I think that's his name, right? Yeah, famous person. Yeah, okay. Uh, he mentioned uh, that the word really has a sense of memory to it along with inside of practice, this idea of attention. And that's really interesting that memory is part of the, the linguistic roots from, from that. So I'm like, well, what if we take heartfulness in that same way? You know, there's a sense of remembrance in, in the heart, uh, attention in the heart. Um, and what are we remembering? Well, okay, here, if I start going a level further of definition, classically happiness and suffering, we can then define those and, and expand the nuances of what that means. But we all want to be happy and we want, we don't want to suffer. And that's true of all sentient beings. And so that elicits some a response in us when we feel into our own happiness, our own suffering and other people's happiness and suffering. And that starts highlighting things for us to work with, things for us to cultivate, even if we don't put words to it. But if we're going to expand this a little bit more and find, well, what are some common ways in which we work with what we might label the heart? Um, in Buddhism, the four measurables are, are classic. Um, so lo um, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And for me, th th these are definitely ways of being and relating and also responses to ourselves and others. What is it like to uh, inhabit and, and uh, live loving kindness. What's that like to respond as loving kindness, to respond with loving kindness and so on. Healing might also be put sometimes in the category of the heart, the tenderness that comes with healing, he healing individually and collectively, um, uh, emotionally and relationally, that work comes up around that, that we notice that to heal the heart, to, to heal individually and collectively, again, our hearts, that comes up. Things like forgiveness, which is really interesting. And we might have a different relationship to forgiveness. Um, I remember when I led a meditation on forgiveness, one of my first times I was teaching, for me, uh, it's all, it was always a, a, a struggle to forgive. You know, some experiences I had in life of, of, of harm that I experienced made me more a little less disposed to forgive. And then somebody in the group pointed out that for them, it was the other way. Like they were like, it was always like, you need to forgive. You need to forgive. And I was like, oh yeah, that's so true. That that's gonna totally, lots of people have that experience where like 
relaxing around forgiveness is maybe the where they need to come and do their work. So which again just points to the variety of 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 our own configurations, our constellations of, of being. There's also aspirations, which I think relate to some of the other things I've said, but we use a lot of um, aspirational phrases here uh, in social meditation, for example, and just in the tradition they're used. Uh, so may you be happy, simple, may I be happy, may we be happy, may all beings be happy, may I be at ease, may you be at ease. These phrases are, are really commonly used to open the heart to ourselves and others. In embodiment, Judith, as part of the meditation, when we inhabit the chest, we can often we often experience the quality of love, something really foundational in our in our chest, and a quality of love that doesn't require an object. Like there's there's a base level sense of love that that permeates us, and especially we can we can sense in our chest, or if we have some constrictions from some. Uh, wounds from our past. Maybe we experience love constricted a little bit there, but there is a little quality that we can, um, even a tiny bit of tenderness and love that we can attune to in our chest. So again, here, we're just sort of opening the door of what's embodiment? What is the heart? And if we say, what is the embodied heart? Well, a phrase I might like would be uh, combining these two that we talked about, inhabiting our whole heart. That, that's a phrase that I personally like, that feels good. There's a sense of letting myself be moved in my heart by what's happening, which is a little different than being moved in the mind. And these are not in opposition with one another. We're just happening to be practicing with embodiment and heart and seeing what comes up there. And to finish here, I wanna share um, a quote from Jack Kornfield from his book, A Path with Heart, really classic book, wonderful. And really in the first chapter, he has a beautiful title and then this is where it comes from. Um, he says, if you have the privilege of being with a person who's aware at the time of his or her death, you find the questions such a person, person ask are very simple. Did I love well? Did I live fully? Did I learn to let go? I feel these questions um, stimulate the heart. It starts moving something in the heart for me. And I like some of these phrases here to, to, uh, that I learned to let go. It's interesting in the embodiment practice um, that we've done and we'll do today, Judith will talk about ways in which we're letting go internally. There's a grip on our experience that um, limits our, our own fullness or limits our, our own capacities. And we're learning to feel safe to let go in ourselves and access more of our, our being. And so it's really interesting Did I learn to let go. That shows up for me in embodiment. And um, also, like I said, includes attuning to qualities like love in our being. And as the more we embody and the more we include our heart as part of who we are and, and work with that, then the more fully I feel I'm living. So that's what I want to say today on that. <laughs>